thinking about medication and how, so if you talk about mental health, how did, what role do pharmaceuticals play in that? Remembering, okay, so this is the disclaimer. I am not a doctor. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not here to tell you these are the medications you should take. My role as a pastor, theologian, teacher is to look at scripture and say, what is God saying to us speaking right here, right now into our day today? And so we're going to consider that. What does scripture say about some of these things? We're going to look at that. And then I'm going to send you out today with an instruction, something that can have an immediate benefit in your life. Like as in this afternoon, after you finish eating lunch, okay? So we're going to talk about medications and we're going to talk about silence and solitude. If you remember, we've been going through using as a pattern or using sort of as a touch point in our series, 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings 19. And we're going to come back to that. But let me touch on the medication question first. Let me look at a few passages of scripture that I think as we consider what role can these pharmaceuticals, what role can um, these medicines play, especially when we think about uh, what's going on neurologically when we talk about mental health. Remember, the, the writers of scripture, they didn't think in those terms. They didn't talk about neurotransmitters or, or, or some of these considerations that we now in our modern scientific, we, we think of ourselves as being so enlightened. I'm sure God looks at our ways of describing the way the brain works and he laughs a little bit because we think ourselves so educated, so insightful. We can be grateful for these things. We can be grateful for the progress. But remember, in Scripture, they're not going to use the same terms. So we want to find a principle that we can isolate or a principle that we see coming through Scripture that will help us understand what God's will for us is today. When I think about a word on medication, can I take you to an odd story in Scripture? I think this is a weird story. It's in Exodus chapter 17. And when we're finished reading it, you're going to look at me and say, what on earth does this have to do with taking antidepressants? Well, stick with me long enough and we'll see if we can establish a principle. Uh, Exodus chapter 17 actually begins with a story probably we have heard and are familiar with. And in my Bible, the, the heading is water from the rock. But we're not going to look at that story. I want you to go down to verse 8. Verse 8 has a story of Israel at war, the people of Israel at war, and Joshua is going to lead them, and Moses is going to play a key role in this battle, even though he is not on the battlefield. So let me read the word of the Lord for you here from uh, Exodus chapter 17. Let me read verses 8 to 15. It says, The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So do you hear what's going on so far? J Moses says to Joshua, go pick some fighting men, and I'm going to go stand over on the hill, and I'm going to hold the staff of the Lord in his hands. That's the battle plan, okay? So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat upon it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, the other on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and to make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the memory of the Amalekites from under heaven. So Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, for my hands were lifted up to the throne of the, uh, of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Did you hear how strange that story was? So there was a battle going on in the valley, and on the hilltop overlooking the valley was Moses standing with his arms in the air. And as long as his arms were up, they were winning, holding the staff of the Lord in the air. But as soon as his arms fell down, the Amalekites started winning. And I want to know, so the Bible's pretty, like, that's a pretty true story, right? They don't give us a lot of details. I wonder how long it took Moses to figure out what was going on, right? Because at some point it says he lowered his arms and the Amalekites started winning. So do you think Moses went up and stood up and said, okay, this is good enough, I'm good. And then as soon as he put it down, he realized, oh, they're losing. It's almost like from a cartoon. It almost feels cartoony, right? Arms up, we win. Arms down, we lose. Arms up, we win. Arms down, we lose. And so did you hear what their solution was? 
So as Moses' arms got tired, Aaron goes, get that rock over there. Let's roll it over so Moses can sit on the rock. And her, you stand on that side, and you hold his one arm up, and I'll stand on this side. And I'll... So what you have, can you imagine if Joshua looked up while he's in the middle of battle, and what he would see was Moses sitting on a rock with two men holding his arms in the air. That would have looked ridiculous. And yet that is how God brought victory to his people in that valley that day. Now, here's what I want to say about this. We have a tendency to over-spiritualize when it comes to certain aspects of our faith. Just trust the Lord and he will give you victory. And that is not untrue. That faith for the believer, for the follower of Jesus Christ, faith is our victory. It is. But we don't strip it down to just faith. In no aspect, on almost no aspect of Christian experience, would we strip these things down to just believe, just keep believing, believe harder. Because on that day, and we see this throughout Scripture, on that day, it wasn't because the Israelites believed hard enough that they won. What, are we, what were we told in the story? That when Moses held his arms up in the air, they were victorious when he let them down. And God used a rock and two dudes holding Moses' arms up in the air to bring victory. And without that rock, and without those two men, I would argue they would not have been victorious. Moses would have gotten tired. That's what was happening. We're told that's what was happening. It is interesting to me that throughout Scripture, and listen very carefully to me here, it is a historical fact, a historical (laughs) biblical fact, that God miraculously demonstrates his power in the lives of his faithful people, but he almost always includes very natural and mundane elements in those supernatural stories. And if you don't believe me, get ready for a list, okay? <clears throat> this is a relatively short list, too. So Noah was instructed to build a wooden boat, right? Now, Noah could have been instructed, go stand on the top of the hill, and I'm going to destroy everything else, but I'm going to put a force field of protection around you, Noah, and I will protect you, but from the flood that night. What was Noah told to do? Well, if you go to Genesis 6, 14, you'll find that he was told to go build an ark. And I want to, here's a little interesting Hebrew tidbit. The next story, oh, oh, no, I'm going to reveal them all. Hold on. You don't want to spoil the suspense. So Moses' parents, do you remember what they did to protect Moses? They, were, they went, uh, Moses' mom went and built him a reed. And here's your interesting Hebrew tidbit, tidbit. The same word is used there for the ark that Moses was put in as the ark that Noah floated in. It was a reed basket or an ark. So first off, Moses was preserved by an actual physical basket that was you know, coated in tar, so it was waterproof. And his sister was tasked to guard him. Do you notice that Moses' parents didn't just push him into the water and say, well, we're going to have faith the little boy is safe. In fact, his sister was set to guard him, and his sister was the one who approached Pharaoh's daughter and said, I have just the woman to nurse this baby for you. Because his sister was set as a guard, Moses' mother was instructed to raise him under the protection of Pharaoh's daughter. But it was a, nat- it was a physical boat. David, what did he defeat Goliath with? Now, David went out in the confidence that the Lord would be his strength, that he knew the Lord would fight for him. But David did not walk out and just stand waiting for the Lord to work, some lightning bolt from heaven. He could have. What did David take Goliath down with? A a sling and stones. Did that mean it wasn't a miraculous event? Absolutely not. In fact, David makes it very clear to Saul. I don't need your armor. I don't need your sword. The Lord fights for me. And yet he used the sling and stones and eventually the giant sword to take him down. Naaman. Naaman the leper. You know the story of Naaman the leper? He was a Syrian general. And he came to the prophet Elisha after being instructed by a servant girl. There's a prophet in Israel that could heal you of your leprosy. It was a death sentence for Naaman. But he went to the prophet Elisha. And Elisha doesn't even come out to meet him, actually. He sends a servant out to meet him. And Elisha says, you, through his servant, you need to go dip yourself. You need to bathe in the Jordan River. And you need to dip a number of times, and you will be clean. In fact, what we're told is that when Naaman came up after his, his, his cleansing bath, 
His, his flesh was like a newborn baby. It was, it was fresh and clean and pure and wholly healed. But he actually objects. Naaman is about to reject the cure that the Lord sent through his prophet because he says, listen, there are rivers in Syria that are much nicer than this filthy Jordan. He almost refuses God's miraculous cure because of the second-rate water of the Jordan River. That was almost what stood between them. And praise the Lord for whoever that servant was of Naaman's who came up to him and said, listen, if the prophet had asked you to do something hard, right, like climb a mountain or defeat a giant, you would have tried that. All he's asking you to do is bathe in the river. Just get in the water. And Naaman was cured, but he was cured by bathing in the waters of the Jordan River. Nehemiah. You know the story of Nehemiah rebuilding the walls? There was enemies who did not want to see Jerusalem's walls rebuilt. The solution to that problem was that Nehemiah equipped the workers with trowels for building and spears for defense. Some of them defended, some of them built. Now again, we see what we hear from scriptures that God was working through Nehemiah. In fact, at the very beginning of the book, we're told that Nehemiah has a place on his heart that Jerusalem needs to be rebuilt. And so God works, but he works through trowels and spears in the hands of the laborers. Well, how about Jesus? Jesus was born in a stable and he was laid in a manger. He didn't descend in a beam of light from heaven. He was born in a stable, laid in a manger. I pushed too quick. I did this with Marigold's pictures last night too at our our dinner. How about Jesus when he turned the water into wine? It wasn't, look, the wine has miraculously appeared out of nothing. He used water to turn it into wine. He didn't have to do that. I don't know why he did that, but that was the choice. That's how God worked. This one I like, the next one coming up. Jesus healed the blind with dust and spit. Remember that story? He didn't say, look, now you can see he snapped his fingers and he spit on the ground, made mud, and healed the blind. Remarkable story. A disgusting story, in my opinion. That's how he worked. Jesus died for your sin and for mine. Our salvation involved, listen, a human court of, and I put justice in quotation marks because justice was not done through that. It was a whip of leather thongs. It was a cross of wood. It was a hill of soil. It was nails of iron. It was blood cells. It was blood of cells and plasma. Burial clothes of linen. A tomb of rock and a stone barrier that rolled away to announce his victory. The salvation we receive, the spiritual life, the new life we receive in Jesus Christ is absolutely a deep and transformative spiritual reality. But it had concrete, real world components to it. Because God doesn't split the universe into the spiritual and the physical We are a unity. We've been talking about this over and over again through this mental health series. We are a unity. We are body, soul, spirit. However you want to define the human being, we are one, even though we have different component parts. And our salvation was worked out in actual history. And so when it comes to medication, I hope now that we've been through some of this, I hope you can begin to see sort of the point I'm making. There's actually one more passage I want to bring to you, and this is probably the most direct scriptural passage that deals with medication or that I think applies to medication as we consider it for our mental health. And that's in 1 Timothy 5.23. Do you know what? Does anybody know the instruction that's given in 1 Timothy 5.23? It's a specific instruction to a specific person given to Timothy by Paul. Do you know what it is? Does anybody know? No? Absolutely. Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illness. This is a prescription in the most plain and straightforward sense. It is fascinating that Paul does not say to Timothy, you know how your stomach is bothering you, Timothy? You're not praying hard enough. Isn't that interesting? Timothy, you don't trust God enough. That's why you've got stomach problems. What is Paul's solution? What is Paul's recommendation? What is his prescription? His prescription is stop drinking only water and use a little wine. As we consider medication, we need to learn how we can receive it as a grace gift from God, not unquestioningly, not uncritically, 
and perhaps not even with the same mindset, certainly not the same worldview that the people around us do. But we can receive medication as a gift of common grace. God made your body. He made these chemicals. He knows how our brains, our minds are impacted by them. It did not escape him. So let me give you, as we consider those things, let me give you three considerations that I would like to put alongside that. Three, some of the, they're, they're, in part they're warnings, but I think the th three things that will help us shape our understanding and, our, and guide our conduct. So first thing I want to suggest is beware reductionism. To say that we are, so what, I'm, what I, want to, what I say, mean by that is, beware of thinking because mental health is impacted by our, the processes in our minds, by the, the neurochemicals, by the, the chemistry, that's not all it is. Don't reduce it to just that. To say that there is a physiological dimension or reality to your struggle does not deny that there very well may be a spiritual dimension to your mental health crisis. Can I use a physical example? And this, this is entirely physical, but it'll demonstrate how just because we see something going on doesn't mean it's just that, right? I suffered from knee pain during COVID quite significantly, actually. I had a point where I was driving to Sudbury once and I had to stop because my knee was so, I had my manual transmission in the car at that time and using the clutch was incredibly painful. I had to stop and take a break. And I took some Advil, I took some ibuprofen to help with my knee pain. That dealt with the pain, but to reduce it to just, well, I've got pain in my knee, didn't really deal with all the considerations. There are actually two other factors that were dealing with my knee pain. The first, and maybe this isn't a surprise to you, was that I was carrying too much of myself everywhere I went. I needed to lose weight. That was part of the reason I was causing getting knee pain. Another reason that I was getting knee pain is because the exercise I was doing, some of the physical activity I was doing, was putting a lot of pressure across my knee. My knee was being forced to hold that weight in, through twisting motions and uh, through karate and things like that, we were kicking. It wasn't just the hinge of the knee, the way the knee is designed to hinge that my knee was working. It was actually being asked to hold me and stabilize me through different motions that were twisting the joint in ways it wasn't meant to go. And so my activity was contributing to my knee pain. So if I were to say, oh, my knee just hurts, so I need to take Advil, it would not really deal with the full issue. If I were to say, I'm overweight, that's why my knee hurts, it wouldn't deal with the full issue. If I were to just say, well, I've, you know, I've got to stop doing karate because that's why my knee hurts, that wouldn't deal with the full issue. In fact, one of the biggest factors, one of the most important things that I needed to do in order to deal with my knee pain was to strengthen my knee. I had to go to the gym and do exercises that strengthened my knee. So don't reduce these mental health struggles to a simple physiological event or something that's just going on in the chemistry of your mind. Just to, to say that that is part of it is not to reduce it just down to that whole thing. In fact, we know that there is a vital link between our physical, emotional, cognitive, and spiritual lives. We receive God's grace, grace gift of medic, medical help, and it may strengthen that one area so that we have the strength and are better equipped to address the other areas of the very real battle we face, soul, body, and spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? We receive the gift in this aspect so that we are now equipped to address the other aspects of that. And again, when I came back to my knee pain, I did need to lose weight. I did need to be careful how I exercise, and I did need to strengthen it. And it came, we brought all these things together, and we began to see how that was part of a holistic solution to the problem. Don't fall into the trap of reductionism. Second, what I would say is, beware of materialism. Medication is never a solution to our troubles, but a tool and a gift to help us in our troubles. Don't think the pill is going to fix it. It won't. And again, I'll come back to my knee pain. I could take Advil all day long, and it would help alleviate the pain, but it would not fix the problem. Beware of materialism, that thinking somehow taking this pill, and I, I, I was, that, beware of materialism, that's just something, so I have something to put on the bullet point, <laughs> that maybe not, doesn't capture the whole idea, but you hear what I'm saying, right? Medication won't fix you, however, it may be received by faith as we look to Jesus, who is renewing all of creation, and whose spirit is giving life to our mortal bodies. Just don't think the pill is the cure. And finally, from my perspective, beware of trivializing 
realize the power these drugs have. I will not go hunting with someone who does not treat a firearm with respect because I don't want to be shot in the back. I have heard stories from people who will go, have been hunting with people who will snap shoot at sounds in the bush. You know what I mean? If they hear something rustling, they just shoot in that direction. Doesn't matter if that's a person, you know, you know, setting up a deer stand, they just turn and they shoot. Don't go hunting with those people. It's dangerous, okay? I don't think I'm saying anything controversial to say that, right? Don't enter in to um, uh, these, don't, don't view these medications as something light, as something trivial. Anything that has such a huge impact on our minds and hearts, something as powerful as these prescription drugs, they need to be used and treated with respect. Respectful caution. These prescriptions that are given for anxiety, depression, etc., they must be handled with respectful caution. There is real danger and side effects to these medications. Seek the wise counsel of those who know both your desire to love the Lord with your mind and have insight into these drugs. Walk through it with good counselors. We had a uh, prescription uh, given to someone in our household and when we went to the pharmacist, what they warned us, one of these medications was, there is a black box warning on this drug. There are instances where you, suicidal, um, intrusive thoughts that will lead, you know, we'll, there's a risk with this medication. And they told us that as they handed it to us because they don't want you to go home unaware of those risks. These are powerful powerful substances and they have powerful powerful impacts on us do not trivialize them when that power is used by god's grace to bless us though what a transforming power it can be if you want more information i won't read it for you today but um in this book which i referred to heavily throughout david murray's reset he has a whole section he actually has more considerations than i ever brought to you this morning but if you want to read it if you want some information david murray's book is excellent on that those are some of the things I would say when it comes to medication. And I think we need to talk about it as a church because it doesn't do us as Christians, as believers, it doesn't do us any good to know that that's what's going on in the world and to never talk about what God has to say about these things. I think there are some issues like that we treat like that. We, you know, we get together and we sing our songs, isn't Jesus wonderful, isn't he saving me, isn't this great? And then we go out and we sort of live the rest of the life disconnected from what we did at church. That can't be. It can never be like that. It shouldn't be like that. So we're not going to live it. Medication may be an important component to God's res restoration in your life. But can I give you something this morning then? Can I give you something this morning that you can take home today? Oh, don't do that. <laughs> that you can take home today. Try in just a second, I'm going to play the video, but let me do the introduction for it. That you can take home today and it will have immediate impact. Literally within 90 minutes, it can have an impact on your life. And before I take you to Mark chapter 6, before I take you to, uh, to the chapter in, um, in First Kings, I want to point out, I want to just give you this video. This is from Stanford University. And I want you to hear that they've discovered something God has been trying to tell us this whole time. So let's listen to what they say, and then I want to take you to the Word. Okay, so go ahead, Troy, go ahead and play this. Stanford University. There has been an alarming increase in the rate of urbanization that's happening throughout the world today. Um, we recently passed a <coughs> rate of over 50% of humanity lives in urban areas. Projections are that by 2050, we're going to be at around 70% of humanity living in urban areas. Along with this is coming a decrease in the amount of nature exposure that people have and the degree to which they interact with natural environments. And then there's a third trend, um, which is there is an increase in anxiety and other mental health disorders, including depression, especially um, in urban areas, as mental health benefits to people and may help buffer against the onset of things like depression and anxiety disorders. So this study, participants went for a walk, either in a natural area, which was a grassland with scattered oaks near Stanford campus, or an urban area, which was the most highly trafficked street near campus. We also scanned their brains before and after their walks. The participants that went for a walk in a natural area had decreased levels of this rumination or brooding, kind of beating oneself up 
um, than did the participants who went to the Poppies and Urban environment. This had the thinking is highly associated with onset of depression. We looked at the parts of the brain that are active during rumination, and we noticed a decrease in the nature participants, but no change in the urban. We don't know very much yet at all about how much nature we need to get these benefits, how long we need to spend in these natural environments in order to kind of reap the benefits they provide. We also don't know how these effects differ across different people. We need to start thinking about how we can integrate nature back into cities and give people more opportunities to interact with natural environments to get those benefits, natural environments, give them for their mental health. So that's a study that they were doing at Stanford. You notice he says there's more research that needs to be done. So it's interesting to, to, to see that, and I've read different articles and things. Um, as I said, I mentioned 90 minutes. I read one article that talked about the impact that 90 minutes in a, a, a natural setting can have on our ways of thinking, our, our mindsets, things like that. With that in mind, can you turn with me to that passage in, uh, in Kings where we were, 1 Kings 19? We started with 1 Kings remembering that we wanted to read it on its own, for its own sake, and understand what was coming through that. But we were then, after we had spent the time reading this passage on its own two feet, sort of for hearing it on its own terms, that we were going to draw certain insights as well, seeing what God is doing in Elijah's life at his darkest moment to, to bring him to a place where he can once again be faithful and fruitful. And I want to read for you, so remember one of the first things God did? So uh, Elijah has gone and he's complained to God, take my life, I'm no better than my ancestors. And God sends an angel, a messenger to him. What did, the, what did the angel give him the first two things we talked about? He gave him a meal and he gave him sleep. He let him sleep, right? So the journey's too much for you, so come and eat. What was God's first instruction to Elijah after he was, had his meal, after he had his sleep? Let me read for you from verse 7. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and he ate and he drank. And strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and he spent the night. I am not telling you right now that this Stanford University study and our passage are tightly linked together. But I think it is fascinating that when Elijah was overwhelmed, he went out into the desert, first off. His first reaction was to leave his servant behind, and he went himself out into the desert. And then when he was out in the desert, as isolated as he was, God then sends him on a journey over many days to a mountain where he was all alone in a cave. It's interesting to me that God's the beginning of God's word spoken to our hearts is often to retreat from the things that are pressing in on us. Today we're going to talk about a negative command. Get away. Get away. And next week, well actually not next week because we're having a guest speaker next week. But in two weeks, we're going to hear what happens when we get away. We're going to hear the positive side of that. But this morning, I want to focus on the fact that Elijah, Elijah was told, you're going to go for a walk, a very long walk. You're going to come meet me. You're going to do it in silence and solitude. I wonder, what, I wonder how much he talked to himself. It's interesting, again, as we, did you hear what that gentleman said from the Stanford study? That as these individuals were walking through the pastoral setting, as they were walking through these natural environments, those, the, the rumination, those self-deprecating thoughts, they were decreased. Elijah went into the desert, lied under the broom tree, and he said, I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. That was the narrative he was telling himself. It's interesting to me that God says, okay, is that what you're saying to yourself, Elijah? We're going to go for a walk. I wonder what happened in Elijah's mind. I wonder what was happening as he walked. How many times he was chatting with himself. How his self-deception was uncovered. How he was, God was preparing him to hear what he needed to hear. If we want to see a spot where this is more directly applied in Scripture, can you turn with me that Mark 6 passage we first touched on? Mark 6. Mark 6. 
So as we're leading up to this passage in the book of Mark, the book of Mark, by the way, if you want a gospel where Jesus is always doing stuff, Mark's a great one. What we see in the book of Mark is Jesus does what God has sent him to do. Jesus does what the Father has sent him to do. And what we watch in the book of Mark is how different people respond to what Jesus does. We see how they respond to God's anointed Messiah, God's anointed Savior. And at the end of the book of Mark, what actually happens is we are inviting to respond to Jesus. That's how the book of Mark ends, is with a, response, with a request for us to respond. And in Mark chapter 6, what we find is first uh, Jesus is, uh, has, gets, into, uh, gets into an interaction with people where they don't respond positively. In my Bible, uh, the, the little heading says, a prophet without honor. Jesus could do nothing. So Jesus said to them, uh, verse 4, Only in his hometown among his own relatives and with his own house is a prophet without honor, and he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. So you hear Jesus is acting, people are responding, and we're seeing how, they, how the people in Jesus' vicinity are responding to God's chosen Savior. But following that story, Jesus now sends out his 12 closest disciples. He sends out the 12, and he says, it says there, Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the 12 to him. He sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. So Jesus now sends them on a solo, well, not a solo mission, because they're going two by two, but he, they are going out and doing the work. The passage I want to point your attention to follows that story. In verses 30 to 32, this is what it says. The apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then, uh, then because so many people were co uh, coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, and listen to this very, very carefully, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves to a solid, in a boat, to a solitary place. This is what silence and solitude are made for. They're not a retreat. And I want to be very clear about this. Silence and solitude are not about being alone, necessarily. They are about getting by yourself. They are about retreating from things. But there's a very big difference between loneliness and solitude. There's a very big difference between isolation and solitude. Some of us, many of our struggles are caused because we are isolated. God is not saying, go live as a hermit in a cave somewhere and never talk to other people. That's not what he's saying. That's not what Jesus is saying here, right? What is going on in this passage? The apostles have gone out. They have done good work in the name of Jesus. They come back and they're energized and they're excited. We read it in other gospels as well. You know, they're, they're so encouraged to see the work of God going on. Through, and through me, I'm doing this. I was part of this. But we see that the impact of this is that people are coming and coming and coming. Again, in the book of Mark, they're responding to Jesus. And Jesus sees what's going on and he realizes, guys, we're not even, we don't even have time to eat. We saw that last night at our dinner. There were some folks who were working so hard to make sure all the rest of you could eat. It was hard for them to find a time to get a plate. And so what Jesus says to them is right now, right here, what you need is to rest. Come with me to a solitary place. Come to a quiet place. I think the reason this is so important for you is because you live in a world where everybody's talking all the time. Everybody, all the time. I was sitting in a car with Teddy the other day, and we were just driving, and neither of us was talking. Which, for Teddy and I, that's a pretty rare thing, I guess. <laughs> we both like to talk. But I thought, you know what? I'm so grateful we can do this. Because have you ever sat with someone, and you felt awkward because no one was saying anything? Have you ever had that where you're together, and you feel like someone should be talking, someone should be saying something? It is only with our closest friends, closest family, the people we really love and are comfortable with, where we can just sit in silence. And there's a beauty in that. 
And there are times where what God is calling you to is to stop working and just come to a solitary place. Come experience silence and solitude. Let me read you what David Mathis has written on this. David Mathis, who has uh, done a lot of work on spiritual disciplines, he writes this, We are humans, not machines. We were made for the rhythms of silence and noise, community and solitude. It is unhealthy to always have people around as well as to uh, uh, rarely, rarely want them. So he's saying that both of those things are an error, right? To either want people to be away all the time or to want to be around people all the time. Both of those can lead to dysfunction. God made us for cycles and seasons, for routines and cadences. From the dawn of time, we have needed our respites. Even the God-man himself was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. That's Matthew 4.1. Went out to a desolate place, Mark 1.35 and Luke 4.42. And went up onto the mountain by himself to pray alone, Mark 14. Uh, sorry, Matthew 14.23. Getting away from time to time has always been a human necessity. But it is all the more important pressing in modern life, especially in urban life. By all accounts, things are, uh, things are more crowded, noisier than they have ever been. He points to something really important there. Later on, he talks about making room for daily respites. Most talk about silence and solitude as a spiritual discipline, and it seems to imply some kind of special retreat from normal life. But small daily retreats can be vital as well, such as a brief season alone and quiet for hearing God's voice in his word and responding to him in prayer. May, these may be the most fruitful in the morning when rested and alert and the chaos of the day isn't yet snowballing around us. Do you hear what he's calling us to? It was the same thing Jesus was saying to his disciples. We need to be alone in a quiet. So like I said, we talked about the meditation point, but in terms of our go and do this, I don't want to talk too much about it. I want to, I want to focus on this because in a world of noise, you need to hear this message. When are you alone with the Lord? And pay attention to, this isn't talking about some intense Bible study, right? We're not talking about getting out for, well, you have your Hebrew interlinear, your Greek interlinear, really studying, you know, what does this word mean? I'm going to do a word. I'm going to look everywhere Jesus uses this word or where, everywhere Paul uses it. That, that kind of study is incredibly powerful. Like the things I've learned through an intense study, it's wonderful. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is retreating from the noise and just being present with our Savior. Do you do that? Will you commit to doing that? Can you make it part of your daily routine? The remarkable thing is, science is telling us we need this. Perhaps even more remarkable is scripture has always told us we need this. Jesus came to set us free. We looked at all the ways that Jesus came into this world as a living, breathing human being, born to be our brother, the first of many children of God. The firstborn. He died for you. The work is done. You can rest guilt-free. You don't have to work 24-7 hoping you can impress the Lord. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Will you receive it this morning and in the weeks to come? Let's pray.